How much do you have? Two minutes to start. What can you do? Three. Three minutes. Yield the, uh, the gentleman from uh, Texas, another new member of the committee, Ron Paul, three minutes. The gentleman from Texas is recognized for three minutes. I thank the gentleman for yielding. After uh, 30 years of federal government involvement and two major legislative overhaul, there are now over 160 federal programs dedicated to job training. The federal government spent approximately $4.5 billion just on Job Training and Partnership Act of 1997. However, the U.S. Congress uh, cannot measure whether or not they are getting a good return on their investment since most federal agencies do not even know if their programs are helping people find jobs. The very idea that a government board can somehow determine what occupations will be in demand at any point in the future is an example of what Nobel laureate Frederick Hayek calls the fatal conceit. No central board, even one dominated by local officials and businessmen, can predict which jobs will be in demand in 5, 10, or 15 years. It is doubtful that a local workforce board in Silicon Valley in 1978 would have tried to link job training services to personal computer markets. In fact, it's highly unlikely that Steve Jobs will be appointed to the Workforce Development Board. The very fact that the boards are compiled of already established leaders for business practically assures that the entrepreneurs creating the jobs of the future will not be represented on the board. In this high-tech information age where financial and more importantly intellectual capital can travel around the world in a matter of seconds, the jobs in demand in any area can change faster than any geographical location, local workforce board could conceivably update the skills with which to link job training. The private actions of individual citizens working together in a free market can best build a job training system that meets the needs of its citizens. Private individuals, local communities, and state governments are also more capable than the federal government of providing adequate help to those unable to provide training for themselves. If the federal government returns to constitutional size and reduces the tax and regulatory burden on the American citizen, federal job training programs of any sort furthers the destructive idea that the proper role of the federal government is to provide for all the needs of the citizens. The belief that Congress has a moral duty to minister to the health and welfare of the populace, both of America and the world, is directly responsible for the growth of the welfare warfare state, which threatens to destroy America's economic prosperity and liberty itself. I am strongly opposed to this legislation and believe freedom and free choices in the marketplace and the Constitution is a much better approach. Thank you, and I yield back. Time of the gentleman has expired. The gentleman from Texas. I, I move to strike the last word. The gentleman is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. This bill is an attempt to improve the federal jobs training program. We now have uh, over 700 different programs and quite literally it's a mess. This bill is a well-intentioned piece of legislation that does make some token changes and some improvement. They may work, they may not. I would like to address another subject which is should we be involved at all? Uh, if we've tried it for 30 years and it's not working, when will we ask ourselves uh, should we be in the business of job training? Quite frankly, I'm not uh, very confident that we here in the Congress are smart enough uh, to do it. Always the argument is that if this is a slightly better approach to last year's approach, this is a movement in the right direction. But someday we have to ask the question whether or not endorsing the same philosophic principle of a bad program is really going to solve our problems. We have no evidence that this approach will work. Most likely, this will become just a bureaucratic adjustment. There will be a cost in the adjustment, but ultimately, government will once again fail in its attempt to do something that it was did not designed uh, to do. 
This idea of local control and block grants is uh, something that uh, sounds good and sounds like we're moving in the right direction, but uh, the odds of it really benefiting are very, very slim. Government really isn't smart enough to do what is intended in a program like job uh, training. We're not here in the Congress smart enough to know what the future is and to make business decisions. It's rather sad to see our business leaders advocating a piece of legislation like this rather than them understanding and resorting to the market to decide when and how to train workers. Instead, they use their energies to come and transfer funds from one group to another in the pretense that they are in, they are able, in, uh, in partnership with the government, to design a program that will fit the marketplace. There is no sign that, uh, there is no evidence that a program like this has been permitted under the Constitution, but better yet, under today's circumstances, and eventually uh, this will uh, uh, prevail, is do we really have the funds to do something that's not working? The funds aren't there, and any time we deal with a program like this, we have to think that it is a contribution to the high deficits that we are running. H.R. 1385 uh, is flawed in that it endorses the very same principles that have been used for 30 years, arguing that the federal government and government bureaucrats know more than what the market knows. I would like to list a few mandates of the bill. Number one, it mandates that states submit a three-year plan for adult job training and literacy or the approval of the secretaries on the approval of the secretaries of education and labor. Mandates that states establish local workforce development boards whose functions and composition are determined by federal law. It mandates that the local workforce board meet federal core indicator. Mandates that local workforce boards be dominated by representatives of the business community. That doesn't give me a whole lot of encouragement. Another step toward replacing the free enterprise system with corporatism. If you like mandates, you certainly will be pleased with this piece of legislation. It spends taxpayers' dollars, the victims, for skilled upgrading for incumbent workers. Those who are still working are required to pay for those who think they're going to get trained, thus creating a new entitlement program for already employed workers. Spends taxpayers' dollars on grants to business and unions for demonstration projects. Spends taxpayers' dollars on family literacy service. Spends taxpayers' dollars on the National Institute for Literacy, the type of bureaucracy this Congress should be shutting down, not expanding. It spends taxpayers' dollars on job training services for which the business community and individual workers should be paying for themselves. And incidentally, and I know this would be of the least amount of interest to so many here, but the truth of the matter is Congress has no constitutional authority to mandate or operate any job training program. And at this time, I would like to yield to my colleague from Illinois. For what purpose does the gentleman from Texas seek recognition? Without objection, so ordered. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. We have just finished a debate on the uh, jobs programs bill, and in, in the discussion I was referred to as a libertarian, but a very consistent one that voted the same way on each type of legislation. I would like to remind my colleagues that voting for libertarianism is voting for liberty. Also, it is a very consistent vote with the doctrine of enumerated powers. It is said in the Constitution that we can only do here in the Congress, which is enumerated by the clauses within the document. So therefore, if it is said that I am very consistent and it wants to be labeled as libertarian, that is one thing, I do not deny that. But in the other sense, I am a strict constitutionalist that obeys and uh, listens very carefully to my pledge to the Constitution, as well as paying close attention to the Ninth and Tenth Amendment. And I yield back. Mr. Paul of Texas. The gentleman is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I ask unanimous consent to revise and extend. Without objection, so ordered. Mr. Speaker, it's safe to say that we now live in what we call a command society. We do not live in a free society where social and economic problems are solved through voluntary and free market solutions. Whether it's food for the poor, homes for the homeless, medical care for the sick, we endlessly call on government to use force to redistribute wealth 
and distribute and and distribute our production of welfare with total disregard for the conditions required to produce the wealth. Is this misdirected humanitarianism? Great harm is done to the very people who are supposed to be helped, both the recipients as they are forced into a degrading dependency and the working poor who bear the greatest tax and inflation burden. In a command society, the government continuously says, do this, do that, and we obediently do it. But smoldering anger and resentment results. Confusion arises because all that government does is supposed to be good and helpful. We, endlessly we are endlessly forced to get licenses for all that we do. Rules and regulations are all around us, from morning till night, cradle to grave. We tax life, we tax death. We tax success, and we tax savings. We suffer from double and triple taxation. Taxes are everywhere as we work half the time for our government. We meet government regulations and rules and paperwork everywhere we go. We can't walk talk, pray, or own a gun without a government permit. We can't drive a car without bells and buzzers and horns and belts and bags, without being reminded that Big Brother is watching, just waiting for one misstep while the rapists and murderers go unpunished. We are intimidated by political correctness to the point that an innocent joke is a crime, and the laws are a joke. Our businesses are subject to invasion at will by government bureaucracy without warning, uh, without warning, pretending to save us from ourselves while destroying our freedoms. As the bureaucracy thrives, the command society expands. I see no evidence, sadly, of a reversal of this trend. We continue to tinker with the bureaucracy, through disbursement and talk of great benefits of block grants and local control, and never talk of the philosophic or moral principles that permit the, the command society. That is, the concession that the arbitrary use of force to mold personal behavior, the market, and our entire society is permissible. Without change in our philosophic approach to government, we will find all the adjustments and revamping of the command society will not and cannot succeed. It cannot change the course upon which this nation is set. Placing confidence in pseudo-reform does great harm by postponing the day we seriously consider the moral principles upon which a free society is built. I'm anxiously waiting for that day. And I yield back the balance of my time.